the comments uh, in uh, IESG evaluation and uh, discussion of, well, probably very brief discussion of um, approving some CBOR tags. And then we'll cover any other issues with working group documents that we need to talk about. Does anybody have something else they'd like to explicitly put on the agenda? Uh, hearing nothing, let's move on. And I just, uh, there's, there's the link at the top to the previous meeting's minutes. If anybody has any changes or additions to, to that, please make them. And uh, let's get started with the errata reports. Karsten, you want to take this? <clears throat> yes, so we, we have errata reports uh, about uh, CDDL um, from someone who actually wasn't implementing CDDL. Uh, he was implementing the CBOR diagnostic uh, notation, but because that doesn't come with an ABNF, um, he was... Uh, uh, looking for the CDDL ABNF for inspirations. <clears throat> and it turns out uh, th there are two problems in that um, ABNF. And um, th there also is an actual problem in the description of the um, diagnostic notation. Uh, the letter is really just an editorial Rata report that I don't think we need to discuss much because it's pretty pretty obvious how this is uh, this is meant to be interpreted. Um, but the the other two <clears throat> probably need a little bit of uh, uh, work. Um, and uh, one of them was about the uh, text strings, um, which are. The text says are essentially copied from JSON, so the, the literal notation for text strings um, is supposed to be the little, literal notation that uh, JSON uh, provides. And uh, that part is fine, but it's not uh, properly reflected in the ABNF. And apparently nobody noticed this <laughs> for, for over a year. Um, because maybe um, writing uh, general UTF-8 text strings in CDDL is <clears throat> just not such a, a dominating use case. So uh, finally, the, the reporter um, noticed that the, the ABNF is, is very permissive, uh, much more permissive so than, than JSON is, and also does not handle JSON's uh, backslash U um, escape. And that part really is a bug. So, for instance, my, my CDDL tool doesn't handle backslash U either because it's not allowed by the, the ABNF. Um, so we, we had to address uh, this bug, and that, of course, raises the question, is there there... Do, do we really have consensus on on the uh, on using just the the JSON uh, notation there? The the ABNF was different, um, so um, it, it's not quite clear uh, what the working group consensus here actually was. Uh, so there, there, there's a little space for interpretation uh, open. Um, so what, what I did was I, I wrote some text into the CDDL freezer document that uh, explains uh, what the, the likely uh, minimally disruptive way to handle this is, including a couple additional lines of uh, ABNF. Um, so that, that is the way forward I, I would be proposing. Um, the second question, of course, is um, do we handle this as part of the errata report? Uh, because it's, well, it's, it's a few lines of ABNF that, that are uh, new that now have been looked at by, by the 
uh, Unicode uh, mailing list of the ITF as well, and we got some feedback and so on. So th there has been some discussion. It, it's not uh, just uh, a random idea of a single person anymore. And it seems uh, also that the discussion is converging. Um, but uh, yeah, um, I think we, we have to decide uh, what we want to uh, do here. So if you can, you probably don't have a split screen capability, right? Um, otherwise, I would ask you to, to go into the freezer document and just show those three lines of, or four lines of, yes, exactly. Um, so th this is mostly copied and, and somewhat cleaned up from what's in uh, RFC 8259, the JSON um, RFC. Uh, but it explicitly calls out the rules for using uh, surrogate uh, characters in UTF-8. Um, so once you have passed something, you you can be pretty sure that this is uh, valid UTF-8. Anyone have any comments? Or questions about what Karsten just said. So to me, they sound like hold for document update uh, rather than uh, um, uh, handle it outside of of the errata process, which would mean reject this errata. If I understand what you were saying, Karsten. I hold for document update and reject are two different statuses, and um, I, I like hold for document update. Yeah. Uh, because it means that uh, the the errata stays it's accessible, to do there. and and implementers can find it. Be my preference, well. Right. Yes, um, they they can find it if it's rejected. Also, but the message that rejected gives is that um, the errata report is incorrect. The message that held for document update gives is that the errata report has some level of validity, but dealing with it is more complex than the errata system is meant for. And that's the message I think we want to give. Mm -hmm. So is and it possible if I to understand... point? Yeah, I was actually going to say exactly that. I could point to your um, post in, in the mailing list, which points to this document um, in my notes when I uh, update the status. Yes, great. That's, great. that's a very good idea. Yeah, I think it's a good idea for implementers to find this little snippet because then they can go ahead and, and use it right away. Yeah, I mean, you could just paste the snippet into your... Um, I could, yeah. Comments. I could also copy-paste that so that it's, it's there, uh, plus add the reference. It, it would, I think it would be useful to have both to, to paste the text, but also to put a uh, pointer to the uh, mailing list. Post. Mm -hmm. I would do that. Sounds good. Unless anybody has objections. Okay, thanks. So this was the uh what's the number of the thing uh 6527 and uh then there is another rotary report uh, about byte strings <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> yeah so th these are actually changed by by the text string change because th there are two kinds of byte strings there are byte string literals that exactly look like text string strings except for using a single quote so this is handled by, by the text in the section dealing with uh, 6527. And then there is uh, there are byte string literals that uh, actually require more processing. And uh, so the, because they are base 16 hex or base 64. And uh, the, the ABNF uh, currently uh, doesn't really help uh, with that uh, processing. So can, can you move up just a little bit uh, so we see the, the two foo equals examples? 
because that, that's really the part that, that is not quite clear to me. Um, so one, one way to handle this would be for the byte string syntax to be aware of the fact that there can be comments uh, within the, the hex or base64 uh, content of the uh, byte string and uh, to allow single quotes in these comments. So this is what the first example is doing. So when you pass such a, a text string, uh, you, you have to be aware uh, that it, uh, excuse me, such a byte string, you have to be aware that it's a um, hex or base64 byte string and uh, have to follow the, the syntax of uh, hex base64 versus uh, comments. And uh, the the alternative is to say no. We we do the the parsing of the the text between the single quotes first, and do it exactly like with uh, byte strings that have the form of text strings. Oh my God, this is so <laughs> also confusing. And um, that means that uh, when you, for instance, uh, uh, copy some. Um, uh, hex values with um, comments in them, and those comments uh, use single quotes, either because they really use them as single quotes, as, as in the Cibor line, or they are using those as apostrophes, as in the don't line, uh, then you have to be careful and, and backslash uh, those uh, single quotes. Uh, so the, the the latter part is actually supported by, by the existing ABNF. Um, so it, it's a little bit of a smaller change, um, but it also maybe is a little bit less uh, easy to use. Um, but uh, yeah, generally, I think that the, the feature of allowing comments in, in hex strings and, and base64 strings. Um, is uh, already a little bit of a bonus addition uh, here and, and uh, uh, doing a lot of work to, to uh, interpret the single quotes differently within these comments uh, does complicate implementations. So I'm not decided here. I'm a little bit on, on the side of saying let's use something that, that is kind of close to ex the existing ABNF, uh, but the, the text of the, the RFC doesn't really decide that for us. So again, from a errata processing point of view, this seems like uh, it's held for document update. Definitely. And the definitely. question is what goes in this blurb? It's yeah, more it's... about like the consequence of 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 verifying this errata makes it so that it cannot be verified right away. It needs a bit more thinking. Right. Um, but is there there any hint we want to give implementers here? It seems like people have lots of opinions on this. Well, nobody sent any of these opinions to the mailing list, so <laughs> I don't know <laughs> well, how, how strong them. these opinions are. So, no, uh, Marco, Michael, Peter, Ricard, nobody has uh, comments. That's it's fine if you don't. But uh... this is a detail of CDDL that I've tried to ignore. <laughs> It, it's also not a very common use case. Right. I mean, you, you normally don't uh, put uh, complicated uh, literals um, into your CDDL. Right. The, the nature of errata reports is that you get a lot of uh, meaningless typos that nobody cares about, and you get a lot of 
really bizarre edge cases that um, nobody thought of before, but nobody's really using. And this falls in the latter category. So to me, if if we were thinking about this without the errata, like we just figured out the first time we were um, working on the document, I would say uh, authors to pro propose something or suggesting, and then that's probably good enough if no one has opinions or or has preferences. Um, yeah. Right. So I guess Karsten, that says um, if nobody else cares, just um, Propose the one you think is best, and um, Francesca will close the errata report. Okay, so I will update the the freezer document with that uh, proposal, and then we can finish the discussion on the mailing list. Excellent. All right. So that's that item. I propose that we go take uh, item three next, just because it's going to be quick. Um, and so the deal with that is, as Karsten's blurb here says, uh, uh, he agrees with the author's uh, response to this, which means he's inclined to approve the registration request. Um, we're just looking for whether anybody else has some comments. So, Karsten, you want to give any more background on this? Yeah, so we had an extensive uh, discussion uh, two weeks ago, and uh, uh, some people brought up this the, the fact that there are optional items in, in many uh, languages and platforms, and uh, these are often implemented uh, using tagged unions. Um, so the, the question was, is, is there anything we want to make special about optional and uh, the authors uh, who, who are among the people who are driving the the development of the haskell uh, language um, the the authors uh, said no this is going to mess up the thing and it's clean as it is and if if we actually try to identify which of the alternatives are null like and which of the ones are not uh, that that opens another can of worms, and and they would like to keep this clean of that. Um, being one of the people who brought this up, I'm fully happy with that answer. I just wanted it to be have been thought through. If it was thought through, and if that's the result, I'm happy with it. And hearing no other comments, I think uh, the answer is, Karsten, go ahead and do your thing. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so back to item two, uh, where we are going to discuss uh, Rob Wilton's um, discuss. We're going to discuss the discuss. And there's the link for uh, details if one wants to see it. Karsten, yours again. Yeah, so the the um, OID draft is from like 2014 and uh, has been pretty stable. We, we did cut back on some of the fringe cases and so on, but um, we all thought that, that it was clear what this was going to be. And then there was a late edition, which is this um, tag, uh, which I call TBD 112, I think. Um, which is an abbreviated version of an absolute OID. So you remove the first five bytes of an OID, absolute OID that, that in, in text form is the 136141. And um, the, the, the thing that we didn't think through when we edit this is that it creates one of those preferred encoding issues that we talked so much in, in finishing 7049bis, uh, which was uh, that uh, an encoder now has a choice whether it wants to use the TBD110 tag, the, the standard absolute OID, 
or the abbreviated TBD-112 <laughs> tag. And if there is such a choice, uh, what is guiding that choice? Uh, in in CBOR, we generally try to guide people to use the shorter encoding for something. And if we can assume that anybody who implements TBD-110 also implement, implements TBD-112, um, then we can recommend that whenever uh, an absolute OID occurs that starts with 136141, uh, that TBD-112 is used. And we can also not recommend this, but we can also require it. So that, that opens uh, a, a number of, of questions that we really haven't discussed uh, before in, in the working group. So th this abbreviation feature seems to be a little bit more expensive than, than we originally thought it uh, would be. It seemed like a led to be a simple addition, but it maybe is a little bit more. So, so I don't perceive implementing, uh, you said 110, but I think you meant 111. Um, I don't perceive as implementing 111 and 112 as being that hard, that difficult a thing on a decoder. Um, so um, because I because I would I think that anybody who's dealing with OIDs probably at some point is dealing with ones that don't start with the normal whatever six things. Um, so I think that's not such a terrible problem. In my perception. Um, I think you should always use the shorter tag. I think would be the should recommendation and i don't know what i don't know what the exception would that to be what why it wouldn't be must um and the reason i guess it wouldn't be must is because we can tolerate having the other one in the stream for some reason i guess the reason why it might not be <laughs> must is because you might not know you know you're putting a tag there but you don't know which one yet and you're going to come back and insert it but you know how big it is maybe or something or i don't know what Yeah, I think the, the complication really is when you when it gets to tag factoring. So you, you have uh, something like like an uh, X500 distinguished name and there are tons of OIDs in there. And most of these OIDs can be described as absolute OIDs. And you're right, I meant TBD111. Um, and uh, there are a few in there that uh, would need to be described as TBD112. Which you can, so you you uh, can uh, go ahead and put in a TBD one twelve uh, everywhere that uh, uh, there is this one three six one four one, and it's still shorter because the the additional tag costs two bytes and you save five bytes, so so the, this is an optimization. Uh, but then you have to look at the whole thing and see maybe all of them start with one three six one four one. In which case, uh, you would put the TBD-112 outside and don't have to do it inside, which is more work. Um, but then again, isn't there an if, if you're tagging a whole array, isn't there the ambiguity already that you can either tag the array or tag the individual ones, and that's just another one of those um, possibilities for the encoder that there are. Good point. Okay, it sounds like we have no further discussion on that. Um, So are we prepared to uh, to go ahead and respond to Rob on that? Yeah, so 
there are four options in this mail, one, two, two A, and three. And uh, no, the, the, the other responses are on, on different subjects. I think we, we can yes. take them off. Um, so we could say, yes, this is a good point, but uh, we don't care about it. That's number one. Uh, the second uh, approach is to say we, we do declare uh, 112 as the preferred encoding if the absolute OID starts with uh, that prefix. And uh, 2A means uh, it's uh, um, a requirement to use the shorter one in the deterministic encoding. So uh, these are... It's kind of obvious when you want to do deep in deterministic encoding, then you uh, should uh, answer this question. Uh, but then deterministic encoding are only guidelines in, in uh, uh, 8949. So any application might come with their own weird deterministic encoding that handles this differently. And the third one is to say, oh, you never can have an absolute OID starting with this prefix because you always have to use uh, 112. For me, that's the, the 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 one that's easiest to implement because I don't have to look at all the various uh, cases, but it also means that uh, recipient has to do some additional checking uh, whether there's uh, uh, that maybe an absolute OID with the TBD 111 um, sneaked in and. Uh, uh, the, the implementation has to reject that. And uh, then there is the question, there is this big company that implemented that wrongly, so you don't want to reject that. And yeah, we know how these things go. Well, unless we've had that problem, that you just said, um, let's not assume that. Um, so again, I think I just prefer decoders should decode and um, I think that encoders should use 112 whenever they can and I don't, I don't care too much about the array optimization um, except that decoders have to deal with it, right? Okay. So, um, well, they already I, have I, to deal with it. They already have to deal with it, right? So, I, I, uh, I, I think this is a bit like Pact Zebor, right? We need to make the decoding rules really clear, and um, we won't always get the best encoding, but sometimes it doesn't matter. Okay, so to me, this sounds like 2A. You might need to write 2A down somewhere. Yeah, certainly. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> text. text is needed, of course, but yeah. uh, direction is what we're looking for here. Does anybody think otherwise that two A is not the right answer? Okay, it sounds like you should go ahead and um, come up with specific text. Yes. So yeah. the plan is that I'll do a pull request, announce this on the mailing list, and then after a few days, go ahead with it. Excellent. Do we want to discuss any of the other parts of it, the, the non-discussed pieces, or just uh, move on? Well, I hope people have read this message.
So I don't, I don't know if people are reading the message now and thinking about it, or uh, uh, I'd, I'd say let's let's say go back and read the message and respond on the mailing list uh, about the other issues, and then let's get this uh, let's get all of this wrapped up. Okay, people. Okay, I see some thumbs ups. All right. Back to here. Uh, so now we're in uh, other other working group document status and issues. Do we have any there to uh, to discuss? Um, so my two documents are, as far as I know, done. This is the file magic and the um network address uh i'm using them we have allocations uh and i'm using them in my code now um and um i think they're probably ready for some kind of review if not working group last call Okay. Anything else? Okay, Michael, um, go, uh, post to the list that you think your stuff is ready for last call, for working group last call. And, um, and then the chairs can respond to that on the list. And if you remember having supported this document for adoption, that would now be a good time to consider reviewing it. Okay. Anything else? Any other working group documents? Any other working group issues? I guess we're on to any other business. Any anything at all? Yeah, one one thing I could say about the working group document is the the CBO Pact uh, work. Um, I promise to to make my implementation available, and I'm really really close to doing that. But I did I didn't manage to finish this before this meeting. So expect this to to hit uh, GitHub any moment now. And I think if we have an implementation to stay at, it, it's maybe easier to to uh, then go forward, maybe with some additional implementations. Okay. The, the, the other thing that I'm just confused, where are we with the time tag? Um, I think with the time tag we are at, I really got to come back to the working group adoption call and look what came in there because I uh, let it slip a bit. Thanks for the reminder. Thank you. Okay, are we done for this bye week or anything else anyone wants to say? I think we're done. So thank you all for joining. And we'll see you in two weeks. And in the meantime, keep the mailing list active. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks. See you then. Bye.